When I look at the world today, I notice the continuous influence of money in all of our lives. Why? This wasn't always the case. Cavemen did not judge their fellow tribes people based on money. The medieval peoples went paranoid about accumulating more money as a means of survival. Victorians didn't spend all day shopping for amusement. Benjamin Franklin once said, money has never made man happy, nor will it. There was a moment not very long ago when the quality of everybody's lives seems to have been traded for the opportunity for a very few to become very wealthy. What happened? What's going on with our economic system? How did money become such an overbearing giant? Our dependence on money has grown over time, but three moments in modern history serve to fuel what has become for many an uncontrollable obsession. The use of mass production during the Industrial Revolution meant a single businessman could run his enterprise of quantity production using a factory and cheap labor. In the middle of the 20th century, the arrival of the radio and television and the simultaneous rise in advertising drove a commercial revolution that was instrumental in the rise of a consumer culture. From the beginning of capitalism, there has been a flaw that has ultimately led not only to its demise, but in the process the suffering of many or for the benefit of a few. Allow me to explain further. Our story begins in the late 1700s, in England, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. In 1764, James Hargreaves invented the spinning jenny, a piece of equipment that created a massive increase in the production of yarn, as people using one could now work eight spools at once. In 1778, Watt had perfected a steam engine that now had the capability of using water to power many machines. These two technologies were the foundation of an explosion in technological developments and the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, spawning the creation of steam trains, spinning mules, and canals. In short, Britain was in a state of massive transformation. In 1772, Richard Arkwright made history in the small Derbyshire community of Cromford by creating the very first factory. Factories were purpose-built to house all the materials and machinery that were needed to produce cotton so that it could go from raw material to finished product. Arkwright's Derwent Valley Mill produced cotton using a water wheel to power the machines. Instead of things being handmade in small workshops, there were buildings with machinery capable of ramping up production to levels never considered before. Around the same time, New ideas in farming were leaving some farm workers without jobs. They added to the move to the industrial towns where they sought out work in the factories. This increased productivity created a ready workforce of laid off farmhands and this was the last ingredient needed to create one of the most powerful revolutions the world had ever seen. Thousands of people came into the now growing cities. Manchester, Sheffield, and Bradford, among others, to work in the many factories that produce goods from blades to silk. Their job was mainly based around maintaining the machines. This included feeding them, cleaning them, and replacing pieces of equipment when they were broken. These machines, however, could be quite dangerous to operate, and many people suffered severe injuries. The worst part? These jobs were with no benefits and cheap wages. Living conditions were very poor, as families would be squeezed into rooms that had no running water or heating. Friedrich Engels called one slum in Manchester, Hell Upon Earth. The UK industrial system was a sea of profit-mongering factory owners, who were successful, but couldn't care less about their own workers' well-being. This obsession with money mindset would lay the foundations for something even bigger to come. The mass production that was now an accepted part of life became even more influential in the last quarter of the 1800s as countries across Europe began to build large battleships and special army technology, which would be useful when, in 1914, 
World War I broke out. Throughout World Wars I and II, the technology of mass production was put to the test. Shells, bombs, guns, chocolate bars were all created thanks to these pre-existing factories. Every day more goods were shipped to the front to be used against the enemy and so this went on for the duration of both wars. Navy planes roared from the decks of our carriers, army bombers, marines, thundered destruction over a 300 mile battle area. However, in 1945, World War II ended, and the factories that were pumping out materials for the war had to adapt to peaceful times. In the early 1950s, markets around the world were starting to stabilize, and the economy was finally beginning to grow. People were rebuilding their lives and their homes, and buying stuff again. Post-war factories were busy filling widespread demand for mass-produced consumer products. Now everybody could have a refrigerator for a cheap price. Then there was the television, something that had been commercially available since the 1920s. But now, it was being mass-produced, and everybody could have one for a much cheaper price. Then, once everybody had a television, there came the ultimate idea. Clothing values are high. No. That's why at Robert Hall, Robert Hall You save on family clothes no. TV advertising Not originally an obvious idea, but when it was put into action, it allowed companies to broadcast their products directly into people's houses every night. As the economy continued to grow, so did demand. This meant more factories, more shops, more mass production, more advertising. The world was speeding towards becoming a money-obsessed consumer culture. By the time the 1970s came along, certain successful companies were beginning to emerge as global brands. These companies were the first to be able to serve customers around the world. These were the first multinational corporations. Then in the 1980s, something happened that would affect the global economy even to this day. President Reagan in the United States made the decision to begin to deregulate much of the financial structure which had been put in place after the Great Depression. In addition, Reagan significantly increased taxes on those earning less than $50,000 and created lower marginal rates for the wealthy. All of a sudden, those that had money were in a significantly greater position of power over those that didn't. Ultimately, the biggest reason that our lives are so deeply centered around money comes from the capitalist system itself. First, a reminder that capital is money that people have to invest, so not all money is capital. In today's money system, if you want to create more capital, you have to already have some. Since the abolition of slavery, everybody in the world earns money from doing work but they have to use that money in order to survive. We have to pay for food, for a roof over our heads, healthcare, sometimes school fees. There are a very fortunate few that earn enough money that they can invest it and create more capital. And this is exactly what they've been doing. The global share of money is more and more slowly slipping into the hands of a decreasing number of extremely wealthy people. Estimates from the Credit Suisse Research Institute released in October 2010, show that the richest 0.5% of global adults hold well over a third of the world's wealth. How are the 1%, as the Occupy protests of 2011 coined them, getting away with this? Well, they use their money to pay for hundreds of political lobbyists who persuade people in major governments to campaign and vote for things that benefit them, such as animal testing laws, financial regulation, permission to drill for oil, etc. Some companies even resort to direct bribery. Second, they advocate the theory of trickle-down economics, which argues that even if people have a lot of money, that it has to trickle down to the poor eventually. 
However, what really happens is the rich trade between each other, so that a little bit of money might trickle down, but not enough to give anybody any capital. This is a flaw that has existed throughout the history of capitalism, and has allowed people to become rich at the expense of the masses. Whilst this is taking place, over 2.5 billion people are living on less than $2 a day, not enough money to be able to live properly. The capitalist system of today is just like playing a game of Monopoly. Eventually, an extremely small number of people will be left with all the money. This doesn't have to be our eventual fate. Like Robert Owen in the 1800s, there is opposition to this method of business. Started in Rochdale in the mid-1800s, the Rochdale Society of Equitable Pioneers became the basis for the modern-day cooperative movement. They started with one shop, and within 10 years it expanded to 1,000. Today, the cooperative group has 4,900 stores across the UK. In many cities, there are also independently owned cooperatives that trade fairly, price fairly, and offer a high quality of goods. The United Nations estimated in 1994 that the livelihood of nearly 3 billion people, or half of the world's population at the time, was made secure by cooperative enterprise. Canadian cooperatives produce 35% of the world's maple sugar. In Japan, one in three families and 91% of all farmers are members of a cooperative. One of the wealthiest regions in Italy, the Emilia-Romagna, is home to 8,100 largely agricultural cooperatives that together produce 40% of the region's GDP. All these examples are successful alternative solutions to the mainstream method of doing business. Today's economic situation is a mess. We are in a world that is obsessed with money. The only way we can get off the road that we're on is through total economic reform. That starts with encouraging more socially and environmentally responsible businesses which advocate fair and sustainable business. That starts by delivering high quality handmade goods which will last much longer than factory produced goods whilst employing less capital, more labor and a better life for more people. That starts with realizing that there are 7 billion people in the world and we can all eat, drink, sleep, work, learn and thrive. Life really is about so much more than money and in the next century we will be finding out what.